Chapter Eleven of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven. With a slow and thoughtful step, I mounted the staircase, glad to escape, by the quiet tardiness of my return, the importunate congratulations which my landlady, attributing my delivery entirely to her own eloquence, was prepared to shower upon me as soon as I came back. Cutting her off, then, from this very laudable exercise of her tongue, and gratification of her vanity, I ascended the stairs, as I have said, in silence, and was first met by Father Francis, who, after embracing me, drew me into his own apartment, and informed me that a letter had arrived from my father, requiring my immediate return to France. "'And God be praised, my dear son,' said the old man, that you are at liberty to quit this dark and fearful country, and return to your parents and happy native land. But go, continued he, into your own apartment, where your good friend the Chevalier waits you. I know not why, but he seems in a strange agitation, speaks abruptly, and appears to me displeased, though with what I know not, without it be your sudden recall to your own home. In truth, I never saw him so affected." I well understood the meaning of the Chevalier's agitation. I myself was agitated, and embarrassed how to act, and consequently I acted ill. When I entered, my friend was walking up and down the room, with his eyes fixed upon the ground, but on hearing my step he raised them, and fixed them sternly on my face. The fear of appearing guilty, and the impossibility of clearly exculpating myself, had a greater effect upon my countenance than perhaps real guilt would have had, and the rebellious blood flew up with provoking hurry to my cheek. Angry at my own embarrassment, I resolved to master it, but the effort communicated something of bitterness to my manner towards the chevalier, who had hitherto said nothing to call it forth. He remarked it, and striding towards the door which I had left open, he shut it impatiently, then turned towards me, and, with a straining eye, demanded, "'Tell me, Count Louis de Bigorre, after all the evidence brought forward to prove that you passed last night in this house, tell me, was it, or was it not you, that I saw enter this door at two o'clock this morning?' "'I should think,' replied I, coldly, "'that what satisfied the judge before whom I was accused would be enough to satisfy any one really my friend.' "'Not when their own eyes were evidence against you,' answered the Chevalier indignantly. "'I thought you incapable of a subterfuge. Once more, was it you, or was it not?' "'Though I deny your right to question me,' I replied, growing heated at the authority he assumed. "'Yet to show that I seek no subterfuge, I answer it was. But at the same time I repeat that I am innocent, perfectly innocent of the crime with which I was charged.' Pshaw! cried the chevalier with an air of scorn that almost mastered my patience Pshaw! and turning on his heel he quitted the room and the house when what we have done produces a disagreeable consequence whether we have really acted right or not we are apt to call to mind every line of conduct which we might have pursued and fix upon any other as preferable to that which we have adopted Thus, no sooner had the Chevalier left me, than I thought of a thousand means whereby I might have persuaded him of my innocence, without breaking my promise to the corregidor, and I resolved to seek him, as soon as the preparations for my return to France were completed, and explain myself, as far as I could, without violating the confidence reposed in me. My resolution, however, came too late. About an hour after his departure, one of the servants of the house where he lodged brought me a letter from him of the following tenure. I leave you, and for ever, you have done me the greatest injury that one man can inflict upon another. You have shown me what human nature really is, and you have made me a misanthrope. I had watched you from your infancy, and I had fancied that amongst the many faults and errors from which youth is never exempt, I perceived the germ of great and shining qualities of heart, and mind. I devoted myself to cultivate them to maturity, and to train them aright. 
Perhaps I was selfish in doing so, for what man is not selfish? But bitter is the atonement which you have forced me to make. Adieu, seek me not henceforth. Know me not if we meet. Be to me as a stranger. Though, for the sake of your unhappy father, I rejoice in your escape from the punishment your crime deserves. My interest in yourself is over, and I would fain raise out from the tablets of memory all that concerns one so unworthy of the esteem I once entertained for him. This was hard to endure, especially from one that I both respected and loved. My heart swelled with a mixture of indignation and sorrow, both at the loss of a friend and at his unjust suspicion. And though my consciousness of innocence guarded me from bitterer regrets, yet it increased my painful irritation at the wrong I suffered, and at my disappointment in not being able to exculpate myself. Occupation, however, in every situation of life the greatest blessing and relief, now came to my aid, and called my attention for a time from the dark and gloomy views that the circumstances of my fate presented at the moment. Our departure was fixed for the next morning, and all the thousand petty accumulations of business, which always hang about the last day of one's sojourn in any place, now came upon me at once. The weather had much altered since our arrival at Saragossa, for three months had tamed the lion of the summer, and it was not, at all events, heat that we had to fear on our journey. Cold autumn winds were now blowing, and saluted us rudely the moment we got beyond the sheltering walls of the city, piercing to our very bones. I would have given a pistole for half an hour of the hot-breathed siroc to warm the air, till we could heat ourselves by exercise. As we approached the mountains, however, it became colder and more cold, and the prospect of their snowy passes fell chill and cheerless upon our anticipations. Yet there was something vast and majestic in their aspect, which raised and elevated the mind above the petty cares and sorrows of existence. I had been grave, I had been gloomy, I had been perhaps peevish, but the contrast between the transitory littleness of all human things and the eternal grandeur of such objects reproved the impatient repinings of my heart. I felt a consolation in looking upon them as they stretched along before me, in the same bold, towering forms that they had presented unmemoried centuries ago. It seemed as if they said, ages and generations, nations and languages, have passed away and been forgotten, with all their idle hopes and vain solicitudes, while we have stood unmoved, unaged, unaltered. Even time, the inexorable enemy of all man's works, lays not upon us his profaning finger, and while he overthrows the arch that records man's glory, and hurls down the column that monuments his grave, he dares not spoil the fabrics of that great God who created him and us. Under the influence of such thoughts, the recollections of the last two days gradually lost themselves, and though I rode along, grave and perhaps melancholy, my melancholy was not of that bitter and gloomy nature produced by worldly cares and griefs. Father Francis was well acquainted with the many changes of my mood, and, consequently, found it not at all extraordinary that I was silent and thoughtful. But, attributing my seriousness to the events which had happened at Saragossa, he wisely let them sleep, hoping that they would soon pass from my memory. Towards the evening, on the second day of our journey, we arrived at a little village, consisting of about half a dozen shepherds' huts, situated at the very foot of the mountains, and here we learned that the Porte de Gavani, by which we intended to have entered France, was completely blocked up with snow, but that less had fallen near Gaba, and that, consequently, the passes in that direction were predictable. Thither, then, we directed our steps the next morning, having procured a guide amongst the shepherds, who agreed to conduct us as far as La Rune, though he often looked at the sky, which had by this time become covered with heavy leaden-looking clouds, and shook his head, saying that we must make all speed. There was but little good augury in his looks, and less in the prospect around us, 
for as we began to ascend the whole scene appeared covered with the cold robe of winter all the higher parts of the mountains showed but one mass of snow and every precipice under which we passed seemed crowned with an impending avalanche which nothing but the black limbs of the gigantic pines in which that region abounds held from an instantaneous descent upon our heads no frost however had yet reached the bottom of the ravines through which we travelled the path was rather damp and slippy and the stream rushed on over the rocks without showing one icicle to mark the rain of winter father francis's mule which had delayed us on our former journey now proved more sure-footed at least than either of the horses and the good priest finding himself quite secure and at his ease dilated on the grandeur of the scenery and the magnificence of nature even in her rudest forms i am nothing of a misanthrope said he and yet i find in the contemplation of the works of god a charm that man and all his arts can never communicate when i look upon the mighty efforts of creation i feel them to be all true and genuine all unchangeable the effect of universal beneficence acting with almighty power but when i consider even the greatest and most splendid deeds of man i am never certain in what base motives they originated or for what bad ends they were designed how much pain and injustice their execution may have cost or how much misery and vice may attend upon their consequences in all man does there is that germ from which evil may spring while the works of god are always beautiful in themselves and excellent in their purpose and yet my good father said i willing enough to shorten the tedious way with conversation though you pronounce the flash of glory to be but a misleading meteor and power a dangerous precipice and love a volcano as full of earthquakes as fertility yet still there are some things amongst men's deeds which even you can contemplate with delight and admiration the protecting the weak the assuaging grief the dispensing joy the leading unto virtue and right true louis true answered he and yet i know not whether my mind is saddened to-day but though all these actions are admirable how rare it is we can be certain that the motives which prompted them were good only i believe when we look into our own breast and then if we examine steadfastly clearly accurately how many faults how many weaknesses how many follies how many crimes do we not find to make us turn away our eyes from the sad prospect of the human heart here i can look around me and see beauty springing from beneficence and everything that is magnificent proceeding from everything that is wise and oh how happy how full of joy and tranquillity is the conviction that death itself the worst evil which can happen to this frail body is the work of that great creator who made both the body and the soul and certainly made them not in vain a moment or two after indeed but so close upon what he said that no other observation had been made i heard a kind of rushing noise and looking up towards the cloud above us which hid with a thick veil the whole tops of the mountains i saw it agitated as if by a strong wind while a roar more awful than that of thunder made itself heard above i knew the voice of the lavange and with an instant perception i know not how nor why that it was rather behind than before us i laid my hand before father francis's bridle and spurred forward like lightning to my surprise the obstinate mule on which he was mounted instead of resisting my effort to make it go on put itself at once into a gallop as if it were instinctively aware of the approaching danger Usay and the guide followed with all speed, and in a moment after we reached a spot where the valley, turning abruptly to the left, afforded a certain shelter. Here I turned to look, and never shall I forget the scene that I witnessed. Thundering down the side of the hill, rushing and roaring, and devastating in its course, came an immense, shapeless mass of dim hue, raising a sort of misty atmosphere round itself as it fell. The mountain, even to where we stood, shook under its descent, 
the valleys and the precipices and the caverns echoed back the tremendous roar of its fall immense masses of rock rolled down before it impelled by the violent pressure of the air which it occasioned and long ere it reached them the tall pines tottered and swayed as if writhing under the consciousness of approaching destruction till at length it touched them when one after another fell crashing and uprooted into its tremendous mass and were hurled along with it down the side of the steep down down it rushed dazzling the eye and deafening the ear and sweeping all before it till striking the bottom of the valley with a sound as if a thousand cannon had been discharged at once it blocked up the whole pass dispersing the stream in a cloud of mist and shaking by the mere concussion a multitude of crags and rocks down from the summit of the mountain long after it fell the hollow windings of the ravines prolonged its roar with many an echoing sound dying slowly away till all again was silence and the mist dispersing left the frowning destruction that the lavange had caused exposed to the sight in all its full horrors father francis raised his hands to heaven and though i am sure that few men were better prepared to leave this earth and had less of man's lingering desire still to remain upon it yet with that instinctive love of life which neither religion nor philosophy can wholly banish he thanked god most fervently for our preservation from the fate which had just passed us by we had indeed many reasons to be thankful not only for our escape from the immediate danger of the lavange but also for having been enabled to accomplish our passage before its fall had blocked up the path along which we were proceeding the guide indeed seemed little disposed to prophesy good even from what we had escaped the avalanches he said were very uncommon in that season of the year and when they did happen they were always indicative of some great commotion likely to take place in the atmosphere neither did he love he proceeded to say those heavy clouds that rested halfway down the sides of the mountains nor the dead stillness of the air both of which seemed to him to forebode a snowstorm the most certain agent of the traveller's destruction in the winter nothing remained however but to urge our course forward as fast as possible but the mule of the good priest had now resumed her hereditary obstinacy and neither blows nor fair words would induce her to move one step faster than suited her immediate convenience so that it bade fair to be near midnight before we could reach the first town in the valley de so after many a vain attempt upon the impassable animal we were obliged to yield and proceed onward as slowly as she chose while occasionally a sort of low howling noise in the gorges of the mountain gave notice that the apprehensions of the guide were likely to be verified a large eagle too kept sailing slowly before us breaking with its ill-omened voice as it flitted down the ravine the profound death-like silence of the air over the whole of the sea there was a dark inexpressible gloom which found its way heavily to our own hearts all was still too and noiseless except the dull melancholy sounds i have mentioned it seemed as if nature had become dumb with awe at the approaching tempest no bird enlivened the air with its song no insect interrupted the stillness with the hum no object of life presented itself except a hawk or a raven shooting quickly across evidently not in pursuit of prey but in search of shelter the hills and rocks were all cold and grey except where the snow had lodged in large white masses which rendered their aspect still more cheerless and desolate the sky was dark heavy and frowning and every object seemed benumbed by the hand of death so that it was impossible on looking around upon that sad chill powerless scene to fancy it could ever reawaken into life and sunshine and summer gradually the howling of the mountains increased and the wind began to break upon us with quick sharp gusts that almost threw us from our horses while a shower of small fine sleet drove in our faces fatiguing and teasing us as well as impeding our progress 
the guide began now to grumble loudly at the slowness of father francis's mule and to declare that he would not stay and risk his life for any mule in france or aragon we were now upon the french side of the mountains and as the road was sufficiently defined i doubted not that we should be able to find our way without his assistance as his insolence became louder therefore i told him if he were a coward and afraid to stay by those persons he had undertaken to guide to spur on his horse and deliver us from his tongue as speedily as possible he took me at my word replying that he was no coward but that having his wife and children to provide for his life was of value that if we would go faster he would stay with us and guide us on but that if we would not the path was straight before us and that we had nothing to do but follow it by the side of the stream till it led us to a town seeing him thus determined i thought it better to send forward Husay along with him giving him directions to return with some people of the country to lead us right if we should have missed our way and to relieve us in case we should be overwhelmed by the snow Husay still smacked too much of the old soldier to say a word in opposition to a received order and though he looked very much as if he would have willingly stayed with father francis and myself yet he instantly obeyed and putting spurs to his horse followed the guide on towards la rue the storm every moment began to increase and so sharp was the wind in our faces that we could hardly distinguish our way being nearly blinded with snow mingled with a sort of extremely fine hail the atmosphere also loaded with thin particles was now so dim and obscure that it was not possible to see more than fifty yards before us and while wandering on through the semi-opaque air the objects around appeared to assume a thousand strange and fantastic shapes of giants and towers and castles as their indistinct forms were changed by the hand of fancy even to the animals that bore us these transformations seemed to be visible for more than once my horse started from a rock which had taken the shape of some beast and once we were nearly half an hour in getting the mule past an old pine which the tempest had hurled down the mountain and which leaning over a mass of stone looked like an immense serpent stretching out its neck to devour whatever living thing should pass before it in the meanwhile the ground gradually became thickly covered with snow and every footfall of the horse left a deep mark telling plainly how rapidly the accumulation was going on still we made but little progress and what between slipping and climbing both the mule and the horse soon lost their vigour with fatigue and we had now much difficulty in making them proceed not long after the guide left us it evidently began to grow dark and it was with feelings i have seldom felt that i observed the gathering gloom which grew around the white glare of the snow did indeed afford some light but so confused and indistinct that it served to dazzle but not to guide all vestige of a path was soon effaced and the only means of ascertaining in which way our road lay was by the murmuring of the stream that still continued to rush on at the bottom of the precipice over which we passed even the black patches which had been left where some large stone or salient crag had sheltered any spot from the drift were soon lost and it became evident that much more snow had fallen on the french side of the mountains even before that day than we had been led to expect our farther progress became at every step more and more perilous for none of the crevices and gaps in the path were now visible and the tormenting dashing of the snow in our eyes and in those of our beasts prevented us or them from choosing even those parts which appeared most solid and secure i had hitherto led the way but father francis now insisted upon going first on account of the sure-footed nature of the mule whose instinctive perception of every dangerous step was certain to secure him he observed from perils of the nature we were most likely to encounter the mule might also he continued in some degree serve to guide my horse who had more than once stumbled upon the slippery and uneven rocks concealed as they were by the snow 
After some opposition, I consented to his doing so, feeling a sort of depression of mind which I can only attribute to fatigue. It was not fear, but there was a sort of deep despondency grew upon me, which made me give up all hope of ever disentangling ourselves from the dangerous situation in which we were placed. The cold, the darkness, the chilly, piercing wind, the void, yawning expanse of the dim hollow before me, the melancholy howling of the mountains, the rush and the tumult of the swelling stream below, the whispering murmur of the pine woods above, beginning with a gentle sigh and growing hoarser and hoarser, till it ended in a roar like the angry billows of the ocean, all affected my mind with dark and gloomy presentiments. I never hoped to save my life from the rude hand of the tempest. I hardly know whether I wished it, despair had obtained so firm a hold of my mind that it had scarcely power even to conceive a desire after we had changed the order of our progression however we went on for some time much more securely the mule stepping on with a quiet caution and certainty peculiar to those animals and my horse following it step by step as if perfectly well understanding her superiority in such circumstances and allowing her to lead without one feeling of jealousy. Still the snow fell, and the wind blew, and the irritating howling and roaring of the mountains continued with increasing violence, while the blank darkness of the night surrounded us on all sides. When suddenly the mule stopped, and showed an evident determination of proceeding no farther. Fearful lest there should be any hidden danger which she did not choose to pass, I dismounted as carefully from my horse as I could, and proceeding round the spot where she stood, I went on a few paces, trying the ground at each step I took. But all was firm and even, indeed much more smooth than any we had hitherto passed. The path, it is true, ran along the verge of the precipice, but there wanted no room for two or three horses to have advanced abreast, and, consequently, Seeing that the beast was actuated by a fit of obstinacy, I mounted again and proceeded to ride round for the purpose of leading the way, to try whether she would not then follow. Accordingly, I spurred on my horse to pass her, but he had scarcely taken two steps forward when the vicious mule struck out with her hind feet full in his chest. He reared, plunged, reared again, and in a moment I found his haunches slipping over the precipice behind. It was the work of a moment, but with the overpowering instinct of self-preservation, I let go the bridle, sprang forward from his back, and catching hold of the rhododendrons and other tough shrubs on the brink, found myself hanging in the air with my feet just beating against the face of the rock. My brain turned giddy, and an agonizing cry, something between a neigh and a scream, from the depths below, told me dreadfully the fate which I had just escaped. Slowly and cautiously, fearing every moment that the slender twigs by which I held would give way, and precipitate me down into the horrid abyss that had received my poor horse, I contrived to raise myself till I stood once more upon firm ground, and then replied to the anxious calls of Father Francis, who had dimly seen the horse plunge over, and had heard his cry from below, but knew not whether I had fallen with him or not. My heart still beat too fast, and my brain turned round too much to permit of our proceeding for some minutes. The loss of my horse, also, was likely to prove a serious addition, if not to our danger, at least to my fatigues. Nothing, however, could be done to remedy the misfortune, and after pausing for a while in order to gain breath, we attempted to recommence our journey. For the purpose of leading her on, I laid my hand upon the mule's bridle, but nothing would make her move, and the moment I tried to pull her forward, or Father Francis touched her with the whip, she ran backwards towards the edge of the precipice, till another step would have plunged her over. Nothing now remained but for the good priest to descend, and take his journey forward also on foot. As soon as he was safely off the back of the vicious beast which had caused us so much uncomfort and danger, I again attempted to make her proceed. Resolving in the height of my anger, 
if she again approached the side, rather to push her over than save her. But with cunning equal to her obstinacy, she perceived that we should not entertain the same fear as when her rider was upon her back, and instead of pulling backwards as before, she calmly laid herself down on her side, leaving us no resource but to go forward without her. The most painful part of our journey now began. Every step was dangerous, every step was difficult. Nothing but horror and gloom surrounded us on all sides, and death lay around us in a thousand unknown shapes. Wherever we ascended, we had to struggle with the full force of the overpowering blast, and wherever the path verged into a descent, there we had slowly to choose our way with redoubled caution, with a road so slippery that it was hardly possible to keep one's feet, and a profound precipice below, while the wind tore us in its fury, and the snow and sleet beat upon us without ceasing. For nearly an hour we continued to bear up against it, struggling onward with increasing difficulties, sometimes falling, sometimes dashed back by the wind, with our clothes drenched in consequence of the snow melting upon us, and the cold of the atmosphere growing more intense as every minute of the night advanced. At length hope itself was wearied out, and at a spot where the ravine opened out into a valley to the right and left, while our path continued over a sort of causeway, with the valley on one hand, and a deep dell filled up with snow on the other. Father Francis, who had hitherto struggled on with more vigour than might have been expected from his age, suddenly stopped, and resting on a rock, declared his incapacity to go any farther. "'My days are over, Louis,' said he. "'Leave me, and go forward as fast as you can. If I mistake not, that is the pass just above La Rue. Speed on, speed on, my dear boy!' A quarter of an hour, I know, would put us in safety. But I have not strength to sustain myself any longer. I have done my utmost, and I must stop. He spoke so feebly that the very tone of his voice left me no hope that he would be able to proceed, especially across that open part of the valley, where we were exposed to the full force of the wind. It already dashed against us with more tremendous gusts than we had yet felt, whirling up the snow into thick columns that threatened every moment to overwhelm us, and I doubted not that the path beyond lay still more open to its fury. To leave the good old man in that situation was, of course, what I never dreamed of, and consequently I expressed my own determination to wait there also for the return of Usay, who, I deemed, could not be long in coming to search for us. "'No, Louis, no!' cried Father Francis. "'The wind, the snow, the cold are all increasing. "'You must attempt to go on, for if you do not, you will perish also. "'But first listen to an important piece of information which has been confided to me. "'As I cannot bear the message myself, you must deliver it to your mother. "'Tell her—' "'I could hardly hear what he said.' His voice was so faint, and the howling of the storm so dreadful. A few more broken words were added, but before he had concluded, a gust of wind, more violent than any we had hitherto encountered, whirled round us both with irresistible power. I strove to hold by the rock with all my force, but in vain. I was torn from it, as if I had been a straw, and the next moment was dashed with the good priest into the midst of the snow, that had collected in the dell below. We sunk deep down into the yielding drift, which, rising above our heads, for a moment nearly suffocated me. Soon, however, I found that I could breathe, and though all hope was now over, I contrived to remove the snow that lay between myself and Father Francis, of whose gown I had still retained a hold. I told him I was safe, and called to him to answer me. He made no reply. I raised his head. He moved not. I put my hand upon his heart. It had ceased to beat. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Chapter Twelve I have told all that I remember of that night, a night whose horrible events still haunt my memory, like the ghosts of the unburied on the banks of the Styx, often flitting across my mind's eye, when it would fain turn to scenes of happiness and joy. If ever a horrible dream disturbs my slumber, it is also sure to refer to that night, and I find myself labouring on, in the midst of wilds and darkness, rocks and precipices, the tempest dashing in my face, and the wind hurling me into the midst of the suffocating snow. My recovery from the sort of stupor into which I had fallen after I had discovered the death of poor Father Francis was very different in all its sensations from my resuscitation after drowning. I remember nothing of the actual return to life, and it must, indeed, have been some weeks before I regained my powers of reason and perception in their full force, passing the interval in a state of delirium, brought on by the cold, and also, perhaps, by the excessive excitement in which I had been for some hours previous to my losing my recollection. When I first woke, as it were, from this state of mental alienation, I found myself lying on a bed, stretched in my mother's toilet chamber. I believe I had been asleep, and felt excessively enfeebled, so much so, indeed, that, though I plainly saw my mother just rising from beside me, I could not summon sufficient energy to speak to her, and I reclosed my eyes. I heard her say, however, "'He wakes! Try, dear Helen, to soothe him to sleep again, while I go and endeavour to rest myself, for I am very much worn with watching last night.' Her steps retreated, for she fancied me still delirious, and I could hear someone else glide forward though the footfall was, perhaps, the lightest that ever touched the earth, and take the seat my mother had left. So acute had become my sense of hearing, that the least sound was perceptible to my ears, even for many weeks afterwards, to such a degree as to be positively painful to me. I was well aware that it was Helen Arnault, my beloved Helen, that sat beside me, and yet, though I can scarcely say my senses were sufficiently restored for me positively to exercise that faculty, which is called thinking, there was upon my mind a vague, dreamy remembrance that I had acted wrong in her regard, which made me still keep my eyes closed, trying to call up, more clearly, the images of all my adventures at Saragossa. As I lay thus, I felt a soft, sweet breath fan my cheek, like the air of spring, and then a warm drop or two fall upon it like a spring shower, and saw Helen gazing upon me and weeping. She raised her head slightly, for her lips had been close to my cheek, but thinking that my mind was still in the same wandering state, she continued to gaze upon my face, and I could see in her eyes the look of that deep, devoted, resolute affection with which woman is pre-eminently endowed, her blessing or her curse. I laid my hand gently upon one of hers, which rested on the side of my bed, and drawing it towards me, I pressed it to my lips. She instantly started up, and looked at me with a glance of surprise and joy that I can see even now. "'Oh, is it possible?' cried she. "'Are you better, really?' And she seemed as if to start away to convey the tidings to my mother, but I beckoned her to bend her head down towards me, and when she had done so, I thanked her in a low voice, but with energetic words, for her care, her kindness, and for her love. Her blushing cheek was close to my lips, but sickness, which had rendered all my sensations morbidly acute, had also made my feelings of delicacy much more refined, and had given a degree of timidity I did not often otherwise feel. I would not for the world have taken advantage of the opportunity which her kindness and confidence afforded, and though, as I have said, her cheek, looking like the summer side of a blooming peach, was within the reach of my lips, I let her raise it without a touch when I had poured forth my thanks into her ear, and then I suffered her to do her joyful errand to my mother, only venturing to tell her, ere she went, how much I loved, and how much I would love her to the end of my existence. A moment after, my mother returned herself, her eyes streaming with tears of joy, and kneeling by my bedside, she covered my cheek 
with those fond maternal kisses whose unmixed purity gives them a sweet and holy balm which love with all its fire and brightness can seldom seldom attain my convalescence was tedious and months elapsed before i regained anything like the robust health which i had formerly enjoyed months of sickness are very apt to make a spoilt child and had i not lately received some lessons hard to be forgot such might have been the case with me when i saw the whole happiness of the three persons i myself loved best depending upon my slightest change of looks my father's delight at my recovery was not less than my mother's and every day that i met helen i could see her eye rest for an instant upon my face as if to watch what progress returning health had made since the day before and when by chance it gained a deeper touch of red or my eyes had acquired a ray of renewed life the happiness of her heart raised the blood into her cheek and made her look a thousand times lovelier than ever we now also met oftener than formerly the ties which she had entwined round my mother's heart had been during my illness drawn more tightly than ever that restraint no longer existed which had formerly proved so irksome to me helen was in every way treated as a child of the family and had she chosen it might have yielded me many an hour of that private conversation which i was not remiss in seeking but far from it with an ingenuity which mingled gentleness perhaps even affection with reserve she avoided all opportunity of hearing what her heart forbade her to reprove and to which she yet felt it wrong to listen when before my father or mother instead of appearing to feel a greater degree of timidity it seemed as if the restraint was removed and she would behave towards me as a gentle and affectionate sister but if ever she encountered me alone she had still some excuse to leave me ere i could tell her all that was passing in my heart or win from her any reiteration of her once acknowledged regard her conduct made me grave and melancholy my bosom was full of passion that burned to pour forth with all the ardour of youth and it drove me forth to solitude to dream over the feelings i was denied the power to communicate my father observed my long and lonely rambles and remonstrated with me on giving way to such melancholy gloom when i had so many causes for happiness and for gratitude to heaven not said he that i contemn an occasional recourse to the commune of one's own thoughts it enlarges it elevates it improves the mind and i am convinced that the beautiful roman fable of numa and egeria was but a fine allegory to express that the roman king learned wisdom by a frequent intercourse with the divine and instructive spirit of solitude but your retirement my dear louis seems to me of a gloomy and dissatisfied nature perhaps it originates in a desire to see more of courts and cities than you have hitherto done if so it is easy to gratify you however painful it may be to your mother and myself to lose your society in reply i assured him that i entertained no desire of the kind but he had persuaded himself that such was the case and still retained his first opinion though god knows to leave helen was the last thing i sought he continued however to turn in his own mind his project of sending me to the court notwithstanding which it is probable that the whole would have gradually passed away from his memory had not my mother to whom he had communicated his wishes from other motives determined upon the same proceeding and with her calm but active spirit while my father spoke of it every day yet took no steps towards its accomplishment she hardly mentioned the subject but carried it into effect as i recovered my health there was of course much to hear concerning all that had occurred both during my absence in spain and my illness after my return in regard to the first i shall merely notice the circumstance which occasioned my father to recall me this was nothing else than a visit from the marquis de st brie of whom the chevalier had instilled into our minds so unfavourable an opinion on his presenting himself at the chateau my father received him coldly and haughtily but the marquis soon by the polished elegance of his manners and the apparent frankness of his character did away the evil impression which had been created against him 
He spoke of his rencontre with me, and he praised my conduct in the highest manner. Courage and skill and generous forbearance were all attributed to me, and the ears of the parent were easily soothed by the commendation bestowed upon his child. Besides, my father was too lazy to hold his opinion steadfastly, when any one strove to steal it from him, and he gradually brought himself to believe that the Marquis de Saint-Brie was a very much slandered person, and that, so far from having any evil intent towards me, the Marquis was my very good friend and well-wisher. My mother was slower to be convinced, but the language of my former adversary was so high whenever he spoke of me, that she also gradually yielded her unfavourable impressions, and willingly consented to my recall, the Marquis having promised to revisit the Chateau de Lorme in the spring, and expressed a wish to see me, offering at the same time, if his interest could be of service to my views, to use it to the utmost in my behalf. My mother looked upon this, at the worst, as an empty profession, and my father almost believed him to be sincere. Thus I was recalled, and my adventures on my return already being told, I have only further to relate the means by which I was saved from the fate that menaced me. Immediately on quitting Father Francis and myself, my faithful Usset had ridden on with the guide to La Rune, as hard as he could. The wind, however, and the snow had delayed them far longer than he had anticipated, and, anxious for my safety, he galloped to the little cabaret in search of someone to return and lend their assistance in finding me out, and rescuing me from the peril in which he had left me. The first persons whom he encountered in the auberge were Arnaud, the procureur of Lourdes, and his son, the latter of whom instantly proffered to join the party, and aid with all his heart. But the old procureur was thereupon immediately smitten with a fit of paternal tenderness, such as had not visited him for many years before, and he not only positively prohibited Jean-Baptiste from encountering the dangers of the snow himself, but he also pronounced such a pathetic oration upon the horrors and dangers of the undertaking, that of the whole party collected in the cabaret, not one could be found to venture. Usset's next resource was amongst the cottagers round about, and by promises and persuasion he induced eight sturdy mountaineers to accompany him, with the resin torches for which they are famous in that part of the country, and which are almost as difficult to extinguish as the celebrated fire of Callinicus. With these they began their search on the road towards Gaba, but scarcely had they passed the defile immediately above La Rune than the light of the torches flashed over a spot where the snow had evidently been disturbed, and on examining they found a part of my clothes not yet covered with the drift which had come down since the wind had swept Father Francis and myself from the path. We were soon extricated and carried to La Rune, apparently dead. Here all means were applied to recall us to life, but they proved successful only with me. On Father Francis they had no effect, though Usse assured me that everything which could be devised was employed in vain. Amongst the most active in rendering me every assistance after I was extricated was the good youth who had saved me from a watery grave. But in the midst of his endeavours, his father checked him, and calling him on one side, spoke to him for long, in a low voice. "'The old fox thought I could hear nothing,' said Usset, "'but enough reached me to make me understand he would rather have had you die than live. "'If he dies,' I heard him say, "'you shall have both, something which I did not hear, and all the property. "'But if he lives, mark if he do not thwart us.' though I will not take care to throw obstacles enough in his way. The lad seemed well enough inclined to help you still, proceeded Usse, but his father would not let him, though he came the next morning himself, fawning and asking if he could bear any messages back to Lourdes, whither he was about to return, finding that he could not pass into Spain as he had intended. This latter part of the worthy old trumpeter's narration astonished and embarrassed me a good deal, and after turning it in every way that my imagination could suggest, without being able to discover any solution of the mystery, 
I was obliged to conclude that, in what the narrator declared he had overheard, fancy had full as great a share as matter of fact. Arnaud might dislike me, indeed, I was very sure that he did so, but how my life might thwart his views, or my death might profit him, I was at a loss to discover. One thing, however, I remarked. Arnaud, after my recovery, came more than once to see his daughter, which he had not done more than twice before, since she had been at the chateau. Her brother also was more frequently with her, and on these occasions the father, if he met any member of my family, was humble and fawning, the son awkward and sheepish, and it struck me that the behaviour of the latter was very much changed towards myself, as if he were playing a part learned by rote, which neither assimilated with his character nor suited his inclination. I also perceived a change take place in Helen. She grew silent, pale, thoughtful. When she looked at me, it seemed as if her eyes would overflow with tears, were it not for the restraint imposed upon her by the presence of others. Her gaiety was gone, and even the servants, amongst whom she was almost adored, began to remark the sadness of Mademoiselle Hélène, and comment on its cause. All this to me was a mystery, and doubt of any kind, even concerning a trifle, has ever been to me a thousand times more painful than evident danger or real misfortune. Doubt is to my mind what the darkness of night is to a ghost-frightened schoolboy. I go on gazing anxiously about me on every side, conjuring up a thousand ideal spectres, and distorting every dim object that I see into the likeness of some fearful phantom of the imagination. Nor can all the reasoning in my power divest my mind of the credulity with which I listened, either to hope or to apprehension, though I well know that apprehension is to sorrow what hope is to joy, a sort of avant courier who greatly magnifies the importance of the personage whom he precedes. In the present instance I determined to change my doubts to certainties, if human ingenuity might do so. Probably I should have accomplished it, but passion, which generally interferes with the best laid schemes of human wisdom, suggesting that the gratification which the heart seeks may easily be blended with the designs which the brain has formed, was ingenious enough to persuade me that the very best thing I could do for the accomplishment of my object was suddenly to explain myself with Helen. She avoided giving me any opportunity of doing so. I persisted with all the ardour of my nature, watching with unwearied assiduity, even to gain a quarter of an hour. But I watched in vain. Thus lapsed, first a week, and then another, at the end of which the Marquis de Saint-Brie arrived at the chateau, full ten days before he had been expected. He came, however, with no train which could incommode his host and hostess. Two servants were all that accompanied him, and the seeming frankness of his conduct even won much upon my opinion. I found him a different person from what I had conceived. He was proud, perhaps, in manner, but not haughty. He was witty, he was well informed, he was pleasing. In short, he was the opposite to that Marquis de Saint-Brie, whom I have more than once regretted not having sent to his long account at the time it was in my power to do so. Was he changed, or was I? Perhaps both, and I am afraid that a degree of pique towards the Chevalier did certainly make me easily receive every favourable impression that the manners and appearance of my former adversary were calculated to produce. In latter years I have tried to judge my own motives in the various events of life, I have judged them strictly, as strictly as it is possible for a man to do, but not too much so, for it is impossible that any one can be too severe upon himself. The result of my self-investigation on this point has been that had my friendship for the Chevalier been as lively as ever, I should have found less charms in the society of the Marquis de Saint-Brie. End of chapter 12 Chapter Thirteen of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen. 
by a long system of exact economy my mother had by this time repaired in some degree the ravages which many generations of extravagance had committed on our family estates and though the pimple-nosed maitre d'hôtel and old Usay, with two other septuagenarian lackeys who might be considered as heirlooms in the family still maintained their faces in the hall yet four other more youthful attendants had been added to the number and on the first day of the marquis de saint brie's arrival all eight figured in new bright liveries of green and gold with well-starched ruffs and white sword scabbards this was an expansion of liberality on the part of my mother which i had not expected not that for a moment i mean to insinuate that the spirit of frugality was in her the effect of a sordid heart far from it it was the effort of her mind which had ever been a painful one she had herself experienced all the uncomforts of that miserable combination a great name and an inferior fortune and she was resolved if possible to save her son from the same distresses at the present instance she was actuated by a feeling of that refined delicacy towards her husband which ever taught her not only to respect him herself but to throw a veil even round his foibles for the purpose of hiding them from the eyes of the others she had heard my father calmly talk to the marquis de saint brie on the former visit of his retinue and his vassals and a slight smile had played about the guest's lip which my father never saw but which wounded my mother for him she instantly determined to sacrifice some part of her system of economy without attempting any vain display or going beyond what she could reasonably afford and the present effect was that which i have described we dined in general a little after noon but on the day of the marquis's arrival which was looked upon by the servants as one of those occasions of ceremony when their rights and privileges were to be as strictly enforced as the official tenures at a royal coronation the announcement of dinner was somewhat delayed by a contest between Usay and the maitre d'hôtel in regard to which should sound the trumpet Usay grounded his claim upon patent of office as the trumpeter-general to the counts of bigorre and the maitre d'hôtel contended for the honour as a right prescriptive which he had exercised for thirty years the maitre d'hôtel would certainly have carried the day being in possession of the brazen tube in dispute but Usay, like a true old soldier hung upon his flanks embarrassed his manoeuvres and at length defeated him by a coup de main the maitre d'hôtel having possession as i have said resolved to exercise his right and at the hour appointed raised the trumpet to his lips and prepared an energetic breath his red cheeks swelled till they looked like a ripe pomegranate his eyes stared as if they would start from their sockets his long pimpled nose was nearly eclipsed by its rubicund neighbours the cheeks and would hardly have been seen but for a vibratory sort of movement about the end produced probably by the compression of his breath all announced a most terrible explosion when suddenly the undaunted Usay stepped up and applying his thumb to the cheek of this unhappy aspirant to tubicinal honours expelled the breath before the lips were prepared the cheek sunk the eyes relapsed the nose protruded and a hollow murmur died along the resonant cavities of the brass a sort of dirge to the pseudo trumpeter's defeat the whole scene was visible to me through the open door of the vestibule and so irresistibly comic was it altogether that i could not refrain from staying to witness its termination again the maitre d'hôtel essayed the feat and again the malicious Usay rendered his efforts abortive upon which the discomfited party declared he would carry his cause before a higher tribunal and was proceeding towards my father's apartments to state his grievances but he committed one momentous oversight which completed his defeat in the agitation of the moment he laid the trumpet down Usay pounced upon it like lightning started upon a chair and applied the brass to his lips the maitre d'hôtel threw his arms round him to pull him down but Usay's weight overbalanced his adversary and both rolled upon the floor together the old trumpeter however had blown many an inspiring blast on horseback and on foot in the charge in the retreat in the camp 
or in the rage of the battle all situations were alike to him and as he rolled over and over with the maitre d'hôtel he still kept the trumpet to his lips and blew and blew and blew till such a call to the standard echoed through the chateau as had never before disturbed its peaceful halls after i had seen the conclusion of this doughty contention i was proceeding towards my father's library when i was met in the corridor by the whole party coming from their various apartments my father resigned to no one the honour of handing down the countess and the marquis turned to offer his hand to helen who followed her giving a slight sort of start as his eye fell upon so much loveliness i did not know madam said he that you had so fair a daughter she is no farther my daughter replied the countess looking back to helen with a smile than in being the daughter of my love mademoiselle arnaud monsieur le marquis de saint brie the hall as we entered it looked more splendid than ever i had seen it with infinite labour the old banners that flaunted in the air above the table had been cleared of their antique dust all our family plate was displayed upon the buffet and the eight liveried lackeys in their new suits gave an air of feudal state to the hall that it had not possessed since the days of henri iv during the first service but little was said by any one after the grave employment of half an hour however the mind would fain have its share of activity and though somewhat impeded by the gross elements of the body found means to issue forth and mingle with the banquet the bird of juno said the marquis pointing to a peacock that with its spread tail and elevated crest ornamented the centre of the table is a fitting dish in such a proud hall as this i love to dine in a vast and antique room with every haughty accessory that can give solemnity to the repast and is it demanded my father with a smile from a conviction of the importance or the littleness of the employment oh of its meanness certainly replied the marquis it needs i think all the ingenuity of man's pride all that he can collect of grand or striking associated with himself to soothe his vanity under the weight of his weaknesses and necessities and what can be more painfully degrading than this propensity to devour it is a philosophy i can hardly admit replied my father the simple act of eating is surely not degrading and when employed but as the means of support it becomes dignified by the great objects to which it tends the preservation of life the invigorating the body and consequently the liberation of the mind from all those oppressive chains with which corporeal weakness or ill health is sure to enthrall it in my eyes everything that nature has given or taught is beautiful and never becomes degrading but by the corruption with which it is mingled by man himself i know not answered the marquis smiling at the enthusiasm with which my father sustained what was one of his most favourite theses but i can conceive no dignity in eating the mangled limbs of other animals slaughtered for our use you look not so cynically i hope on all other failings of humanity demanded my mother willing to change the subject and changing it to one on which every frenchwoman thinks or has thought a great deal she added love for instance the marquis bowed no one can be more devoted replied he to the lovelier part of the creation than i am and yet i cannot but think that the ancients did well to represent venus as springing from the foam of the sea somewhat light you would say in her nature rejoined my father and variable as her parent waves and sometimes as cold and as uncertain too said i but as i did so i saw a slight flush pass over helen's brow and i added but you forget monsieur le marquis or rather like a skilful arguer you do not notice that the blood of coilus which we translate almost literally to drop from heaven was mingled with the foam of the sea to produce the goddess happily turned replied the marquis with a smile but i trust my young friend you are aware that the queen of love is only to be won by the god of arms as our sweet and tumid rackan would put it have you yet entered the path in which you were born to distinguish yourself i mean the service of your king with somewhat of a blush i replied that i had not and the marquis proceeded 
Fine now, tis a shame that a sword, which I know, to my cost, is a good one, should rust in its scabbard. Every gentleman, whatever may be his ultimate objects in life, should serve his country for at least one campaign. It is rumoured that our wars in Italy will infallibly be renewed. In that case, I shall, of course, take the command of my regiment, and if your noble father will allow you to accompany me, we will turn the two good swords that once crossed upon a foolish quarrel against the enemies of our king and our country. Without a moment's hesitation, I should have accepted the proposal, but my mother interposed. I have already, said she, after having expressed her thanks to the Marquis for the honour he proposed to her son, I have already written to her highness the Countess de Soissons, who honoured me in my youth with her favour and affection, soliciting, if it be possible, that Louis may, for a short period, enjoy the advantage of being near Monsieur le Comte, her son. I have no doubt that she will comply with my request, and, at all events, we must, of course, suspend every other plan till her highness's answer is received. The Marquis appeared somewhat mortified, but immediately changed the conversation to other subjects, and certainly no man I ever met could render himself more fascinating when he chose to do so. His language was as elegant as his manners, and he mingled with a playful, shining, unforced wit, a slight degree of cynical bitterness, which rendered it more exciting by its pungency. He had the great art, too, of suiting his conversation exactly to those with whom he conversed, not precisely as the chameleon, taking its hue from the object next to it, but rather like a fine piece of polished china, receiving a sufficient reflection from whatever salient colour was placed near, without losing the original figures with which it was itself marked. Thus he never lost in manner a certain degree of pride, which was the great master passion of his soul. But when he wished to please or win, he made even this pride subservient to his purpose, by acting as an opposition to his courtesy and condescension nor did he ever in the fits of that cynical humour which he either affected or possessed from nature go beyond the exact point at which it could amuse or stimulate those that listened to him and he calculated with wonderful insight into their characters the precise portions that each could bear or relish with whatever feelings one entered his society one quitted it struck and fascinated i did so myself notwithstanding the warning i had received with regard to him notwithstanding a strong prepossession against him i felt attracted amused and pleased and every minute that i passed in his company i had to recall the demoniacal passions his countenance had expressed at estelle and ask myself can this be the same man it was and when closely observed there was a glance of malignity in the eye which if rightly read would have told that there the real man shone out, and that the rest was all a mask. The nations of the East have a superstition that their dives, afri, and other evil spirits have the power of transforming themselves into the most beautiful and enticing shapes, but that some one spot of their body is always exempt from this change and remains in its original hideousness. Thus I believe it is with the human character, give it what gracious form you will there is still some original feature will rest unchanged to show what shape it has at first received from nature the marquis de saint brie however maintained the doubtful favour he had gained with the inhabitants of the chateau de l'orme as long as he remained within its walls which was during the space of three days each passed much like the former with the exception of the second, in the course of which we went out upon the mountains to shoot the izzard. At the hour appointed for setting forth, it so happened that I was a moment later than my father and the Marquis. My mother, too, was in the court, seeing the preparations for our departure, when, on going from my bedchamber into the corridor, I was met by Helen, who, instead of passing me hastily, as she usually did, paused a moment, as if anxious to speak. Her cheek was rather flushed, and I never did behold her looking more lovely. The temptation to delay was not to be resisted, and besides, such a moment might never come again. "'Helen,' said I, taking her hand, "'dearest Helen, I would give a word to speak with you alone, for but five minutes. You once said you loved me, you promised me you would always love me. 
Helen, you must have seen how much I have wished for such an opportunity, and yet you have never, since my return, given me one moment of your private time. Indeed, Louis, she answered, still letting me keep her hand. I could not then. I thought it would be wrong. Now, perhaps I may think differently, and I will no longer avoid you as I have done. But what I sought you for now was to say, Beware of that Marquis de saint -Brie. I am sure, I feel sure, that he is a villain. And, oh, Louis, beware of him, for your sake, for mine. So saying, she waited for no reply, but drawing away her hand, glided back to the Countess's apartments. Oh, what a nicely balanced lever is the mind of youth! A breath will depress it, or a breath will raise. For days before I had been gloomy and desponding. Existence and all that surrounded it I had looked upon with a jaundiced eye, which saw only defects. I could have quarrelled with the sunbeam for ever casting a shade, the summer breeze for ever bearing a vapour on its wings. And now I went away from Helen with a heart beating high with expectation and delight. One kind word, one affectionate look, one expression of interest and love, and every cloud was banished from my mind, and all was again sunshine and summer and enjoyment. My father and the Marquis had already set out, but a few steps brought me to their side, and speeding on towards the heights above the valley of Argelay, we separated to beat a narrow lateral dell, while the servants, spreading in a larger circle, drove the game in towards us. My father took his range along one side of the hollow, and I on the other, while the Marquis chose a path above mine, having a view of the whole side of the hill. For some time we met with little success, when suddenly an izzard bounded away along the path about three hundred yards in advance. Before I could fire it was out of shot, but springing after it I followed eagerly along the shelf of rock. Knowing that a little farther a precipice intervened, which I did not believe the animal could leap, and consequently, if it escaped me, it must run up the hill and cross the Marquis, or go down into the valley and come within my father's range. As I went on, circling round the mountain, a piece of rock jutted out across the path about thirty yards in advance, and hid the precipice from my view. The izzard I doubted not was there, hesitating on the brink, as they often do when the leap is dangerous and hoping to obtain a shot at it before it turned, I was hurrying on, when suddenly I heard the ringing of a carbine, and a bullet whistled close to my ear. Its course must have lain within two inches of my head, and, not a little angry, I turned, and saw the Marquis standing on a rock a little way above me. "'There, there!' cried he, pointing with his hand. "'There! I have missed him! Why don't you fire?' At that moment I caught a sight of the izzard actually springing up the most perpendicular part of the mountain. It was almost beyond the range of my carbine, but, however, I fired, and the animal rolled down, dead, into the valley. Neither the Marquis nor myself alluded to the shot which he had discharged, and it remains a very great doubt in my mind whether he had missed me or the izzard. End of chapter 13 Chapter Fourteen of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen. It may seem strange, very strange, that with such suspicions on my mind I should accept an invitation to visit the man who had excited them. Nevertheless, I did, and what is perhaps still more strange, those very suspicions were in some degree the cause of my doing so. When the Marquis first proposed that I should spend a day or two with him at his pavilion de chasse in the neighbourhood of Bagnères, I felt a doubt in regard to it, for which I was ashamed. I was afraid of feeling afraid of anything, and I instantly accepted his invitation. I know not whether this may be very comprehensible to every one, but let any man remember his feelings when he was nineteen an age at which we have not learned to distinguish between courage and rashness, prudence and timidity, and he will, at least in some degree, 
understand though he may blame my having acted as i did i would willingly have suffered the marquis to be a day in advance before i fulfilled my engagement longing for that promised half hour of conversation with helen which was to me one of those cherished anticipations on which the heart of youth spends half its ardour oh how often i wish nowaday that i could long for anything as i did in my childhood and fill up the interval between the promise and the fulfilment with bright dreams worth a world of realities but alas the uncertainty of everything earthly gradually teaches man to crowd the vacancy of expectation with fears instead of hopes and to guard against disappointment instead of dreaming of enjoyment however as the marquis was only to remain three days at his pavilion ere he set out for paris he insisted on my accompanying him when he left the chateau de Lorme. the ride was delightful in itself but he contrived to withdraw my attention from the scenery by the charms of his conversation the first subject that he entered upon was my proposed visit to the court and he drew a thousand light yet faithful sketches of all the principal courtiers of the day amongst others said he after specifying several that i now forget you will see the duke of bouillon brave shrewd yet hasty always hurrying into danger with fearless impetuosity and then finding means of escape with a coolness which if exerted at first would have kept him free from peril he puts me in mind of a rope dancer whose every spring seems as if it would be his last and yet he catches himself somehow when he appears inevitably gone in his brother turenne a very different character is to be met with or rather perhaps the same character without its defects what in bouillon is rashness in turenne is courage what is cunning in the one is wisdom in the other i believe turenne would sacrifice himself to his country but if bouillon were to erect an altar to any deity it would be i am afraid to himself then there is the young and daring jean de gondy who is striving for the archbishopric of paris the most talented man in europe but gifted or cursed with that strange lightness of soul which sports with everything as if it were a trifle who would overthrow an empire but to remodel it or raise an insurrection but to guide the wild horses that draw the chariot of tumult had he lived in the ancient days he would have burnt the temple of the ephesian goddess to build in one olympiad what cost two hundred years his mind in short is like the ocean deep and profound that plays with a feather or supports a navy but now is rippling in golden tranquillity and now is raging in fury and in tumult that now scarce shakes the pebble on the shore and now spreads round confusion destruction and death in regard to the count de soissons to whom you go his character is difficult to know but yet i think i know it he has many high and noble qualities and though at present he appears intolerably proud yet that is a fault of his education not of his disposition he has it from his mother and will conquer it i doubt not but there is one virtue he wants without which talents and skills and courage are nothing he wants resolution he is somewhat obstinate but that does not imply that he is resolute and a man without resolution may be looked upon in the light of a miser all the riches that nature can give are useless to him because he has not the courage to make use of them you must have been a very keen observer said i of those persons with whom you have mingled and doubtless also of human life in general life replied he as life is very little worth considering it is a stream that flows by us without our knowing how its turbulence or its tranquillity i believe depend little upon ourselves if there be rain in the mountains it will be a torrent if it prove a dry season it will be a rivulet we must let it flow as it will till it comes to an end and then we have nothing to do but die and of death said i have you not thought of that 
as it is the very opposite of life it may have merited some more thought less far less said he with some trouble we may change the course of the rivulet but with all our efforts we cannot alter the bounds of the sea look on death how we will we can derive nothing from it the pleasures and pains of existence are so balanced we cannot tell whether death be a relief or a deprivation and as to the bubble of something after death it is somewhat emptier than that now floating down the stream i started and said nothing and gradually the conversation dropped of itself after a pause he again turned it into other channels speaking of pleasure and the excesses and gratifications of a court and though he recommended moderation as the most golden word that any language possessed yet it was upon no principle of virtue either moral or religious it was for the sake of pleasure alone that it might be more durable in itself and never counterbalanced by painful consequences my mind naturally turned to my many conversations with the chevalier and by comparison i found his morality a very different quality i merely replied however that i believed if people had no stronger motives to moderation than the expectation of remote effects they would seldom put much restraint upon their passions soon after we arrived at the pavilion de chasse and i must own that never did a more exquisitely luxurious dwelling meet my eye it was not large but all was disposed for ease and pleasure piles of cushions rich carpets easy chairs persian sofas exquisite tapestries filled every chamber books too and pictures were there but the books and the pictures were generally of one class catullus ovid petronius or tibullus lay upon the tables or on the shelves while the walls were adorned with many a nymph and many a goddess liberal of their charms though at the same time horace and virgil appeared cast upon one of the sofas and every now and then the eye would fall on one of the sunshiny landscapes of claude de lorraine and dream for a moment amidst the sleepy splendour of his far perspectives and is it possible said i turning to the marquis as he led me through this luxurious place is it possible that you can quit such a spot willingly for the dangers and hardships of war there are various sorts of pleasure replied he and without varying and changing and opposing them one to another we cannot enjoy any long every man has his particular pleasures and his particular arrangement of them i for instance require the stimulus of war to make me enjoy these luxuries of peace but you have yet seen little of the beauties of the place let us go out into the park the perfection of a house of this kind depends almost entirely upon the grounds that surround it in the two days that i spent at the pavilion of monsieur de saint brie passed like lightning not a moment paused for he contrived to fill every hour with some pleasure of its own but it was all too sweet one felt it to be luscious like the luxurious romans he mingled his wine with honey and the draught was both cloying and intoxicating on the third morning i rose early from my bed to take a review of the beautiful grounds which surrounded the house and after wandering about for half an hour i turned to a river that ran through the park resolving to take my way towards the house by the side of the waters the path that i followed was hidden by trees but there was a transverse alley that came down to the water and joined the one in which i walked about one hundred yards farther on as i advanced i heard the voice of the marquis talking earnestly with some other person and though at first what he said was very indistinct yet i soon heard more without seeking to do so or indeed wishing it hold him down said the marquis when you have got him safely to the ground and cut his throat just under the jaws if you go deep enough he is dead in a moment as he gave this somewhat bloody direction he turned into the same path with myself accompanied by another person whose appearance is worthy of some description he was about my own height which is not inconsiderable 
but at the same time he was remarkably stout i should say even fat with a face in which a great degree of jollity and merriment was mingled with a leering sort of slyness of eye and a slight twist of the mouth that gave rather a sinister expression to the drollery of his countenance he wore short black moustachios and a small pointed beard and from his head hung down upon his shoulders a profusion of black wavy hair his dress also was somewhat singular instead of the broad low-crowned plumed hats which were then in fashion his head was surmounted with an interminable beaver whose high pointed crown resembled the steeple of a church we have seen many of them since amongst the english and the swiss but at that time such a thing was so uncommon and its effect appeared so ridiculous that i could scarce refrain from laughing though my blood was somewhat chilled with the conversation i had just overheard the rest of this stout gentleman's habiliments consisted of a somewhat coarse brown pourpoint laced with tarnished gold and slashed eau de chausse tied with black ribbons while a huge sword and dagger ornamented his side and a pair of funnel-shaped riding boots completed his equipment the marquis's eye fell on me instantly and having advanced without embarrassment he embraced me and gave me the compliments of the morning then turning he introduced his friend monsieur de simon the greatest fisherman in france said he we were speaking just now about killing a carp he continued which you know is dreadfully tenacious of life are you a fisherman at all i answered not in the least and the conversation went on for some time on various topics till at length m de simon took his leave i am sorry you cannot take your breakfast with us said the marquis but remember when i am gone you are most welcome to fish whenever you think fit upon my property i thank you i thank you most noble marquis said the other with a curious sort of roguish twinkle of the eye i will take you at your word and will rid your streams of those gudgeons which you dislike so much but which i dote upon oh tis a dainty fish a gudgeon at about one o'clock my horse was ready and i took leave of the marquis i cannot say with feelings either of reverence or regard and i have always found it an invariable fact that when a man has amused us without gaining our esteem and pleased us without winning our confidence there is something naturally bad at the bottom of his character which we should do well to avoid as i mounted my horse i remarked that my worthy valet Houssay, had imbibed as much liquor as would permit him to stand upright and that it was not without great difficulty and scrupulous attention to the equipoise that he at all maintained his vertical position your servant is tipsy said the marquis you had better leave him here till he recovers his intellects i am sober as a priest hiccuped Houssay who overheard the accusation the marquis brought against him and repelled it with the most drunken certainty of his own sobriety monseigneur you do me wrong i am sober upon my conscience and my temper so saying he swung himself up to his horse's back and forgetting to wait for me galloped on before sounding a charge through his fist as if he was leading on a regiment of horse the marquis laughed and once more bidding him adieu i followed the pot valiant trumpeter who without any mercy on his poor horse urged him on up the road to lourdes as fast as he could go very soon i doubt not he quite forgot that i was behind for following much more slowly as i did not choose to fatigue my jennet at the outset i soon lost sight of him and for half an hour perceived no traces of him whatever i have heard that the effect of the fresh air far from diminishing the inebriation of a drunkard greatly increases it probably this was the case with Houssay, for at the distance of about four miles from the park of the marquis i found him lying by the side of the road apparently sound asleep while his horse was calmly turning the accident of his master to the best account by cropping the grass and shrubs at the roadside the accident embarrassed me a good deal for i had set out late and of course i could not leave the poor drunkard to be gnawed by the bears or devoured by the wolves 
whose regard for a sleeping man might be found of somewhat too selfish a nature after having shaken him therefore two or three times for the purpose of recalling him to himself without producing any other effect than an inarticulate grunt i returned to a village about a mile nearer bagnere and having procured the aid of some cottagers i had the overthrown trumpeter carried back and left him there in security till he should have recovered from the state of intoxication in which he had plunged himself all this delayed me for some time so that it was near four o'clock before i again resumed my journey nor was i sorry indeed that the sun had got behind the mountains whose long shadows saved my eyes from the horizontal rays which as my way lay due west would have dazzled me all along the road had i set out earlier in about two hours it began to grow dusk and i put my horse into a quicker pace lest the family at the chateau should conclude that i intended to remain another night there was one person also that i knew would be anxious till they saw me return safe and for the world i would not have given helen a moment's unnecessary pain what made her suspect the marquis of any evil designs towards me i knew not but i knew that she did suspect him and that was sufficient to make me hurry on to assure her of my safety there is a thick wood covers the side of the mountain about five miles from the chateau de l'orme extending high up on the one hand very nearly to the crest of the hill and spreading down on the other till the stream of the valley bathes the roots of its trees in a few minutes after i had entered this wood i suddenly heard the clatter of a horse's hoofs close behind me so near it must have sprung out of the coppice i instantly turned my head to ascertain what it was when i received a violent blow just above the eyebrow which nearly laid my skull bare and struck me headlong to the ground before i could see who was the horseman though bruised and dizzied i endeavoured to struggle up but my adversary threw himself from his horse grappled with me and cast me back upon the ground with my face upwards oh how shall i describe the fearful struggle for life that then ensued the agonizing grasp with which i clenched the hands wherewith he endeavoured to reach my neck the pressure of his knees upon my chest the beating of my heart as i still strove yet found myself overmastered and my strength failing the dreadful eager haste with which he tried to hold back my head and gash my throat with the knife he held in his hand and the muttered curses he vented on finding my resistance so long protracted five times he shook off my grasp and five times i caught his hands again as they were in the act of completing his object at the same time i could hear his teeth crunching against each other with the violence of his efforts my hands were all cut and bleeding his dress was nearly torn to pieces the strength of both was well-nigh exhausted when we heard the sounds of voices advancing along the road though our struggle had hitherto been silent i now called loudly for assistance he heard the noise also then this shall settle it cried he raising his arm to plunge the knife into my chest but i interposed my hand and though the force with which he dealt the blow was such as to drive the point through my palm yet this saved my life for before he could repeat the stroke the horseman had come up attracted by the cries i continued to utter one of them sprang from his horse beheld the deathly struggle going on and not knowing which was the aggressor but seeing that one held the other at a fatal disadvantage called to my assailant instantly to desist or die the assassin again raised his arm the horseman saw him about to strike levelled a pistol at his head fired and the murderer dropping the weapon from his hand staggered up upon his feet reeled for a moment and then fell dead across my chest End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of de l'orme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen o oh, life thou strange mysterious tie between the spirit and the clay 
what is it makes the bravest of us shrink from that separation which the small dagger or the tiny asp can so easily effect for a moment i lay to recover myself from all the agitated feelings that hurried through my heart and then struggling up i rolled the ponderous mass of the dead man from off my breast and rose from the ground is it count louis de bigot said the voice of the chevalier de montenero i answered that it was and he proceeded i thought so infatuated young man why would you trust yourself in the hands of your enemy when you were warned of his cruelty and his baseness because i answered i thought that a person who had done injustice to me might also do injustice to him when a man has the means of clearing himself and does not choose to do so replied the chevalier while well understanding to what i alluded he must rest under the imputation of guilt till he does now sir i leave you arnault give him your assistance and rejoin me to-morrow morning and so saying without farther explanation he turned his horse and galloped away though the evening light was of that dim and dusky nature which affords perhaps less assistance to the eye than even the more positive darkness of the night yet i could very well distinguish by the height and form that the person the chevalier called arnault was not the little large-headed procureur of lords but rather his son and as soon as we were alone he confirmed my conjecture by his voice asking if i were hurt not much jean baptiste replied i my hands are cut and he has grazed my throat with his knife but he has not injured me seriously catch my horse good arnaud i continued and ride on to the cottage about half a mile on the road bring some one with lights that we may see who this is though in truth i guess you had better take my pistols monsieur le comte said the honest youth lest there should be a second of these gentlemen in the wood i took one and leaving him the other for his own defence sent him on as fast as possible to the cottage for although from the manner in which my assailant had attempted to effect my death so like the marquis de saint brie's directions for killing the carp i had little doubt in regard to whom i should find in the person of the dead man yet i wished to ascertain the fact more precisely that no doubt should remain upon my mind in regard to monsieur de saint brie himself soon after jean baptiste was gone the moon began to raise her head over the mountain and streaming directly down the road showed me fully the person of the dead man through whose head the ball of the chevalier's pistol had passed in a direct line causing almost instantaneous death all doubt was now at an end there lay the large heavy limbs of the man who had been called monsieur de simon while his steeple-crowned hat appeared rolled to some distance on the road the effects of the dreadful struggle between us were visible in all his apparel his doublet was torn in twenty different places with the straining grasp in which i had held him and an immense black wig which he had worn as a sort of disguise had followed his hat and left his head bare in rising i had rolled him off me on his back so that he was lying with the beams of the moon shining full in his face i advanced and gazed upon him for a moment and now as he appeared with his shaved head and the phrase or ruff torn off his neck i could not help thinking that his countenance was familiar to me the mustachios and the beard it was true made a great alteration but in every other respect it was the face of the capuchin who had joined in attempting to plunder me at luce i looked nearer and remembering that in six months his beard would have had full time to grow i became convinced that it was the same i examined him attentively i perceived a sort of packet protruding from a pocket in the breast of his doublet and taking it out i found it to be a bundle of old and somewhat worn papers wrapped in a piece of sheep's skin and tied round with a leathern thong amongst these i doubted not that i should find some interesting correspondence between the subordinate assassin and his instigator and consequently took care to secure them after which i waited quietly for the return of jean baptiste who i doubted not would relieve me from my troublesome guard over the dead body as soon as he could procure lights and assistance his absence of course appeared long 
but after the lapse of about ten minutes I began to perceive some glimmering sparks through the trees, and a moment after the inhabitants of the cottage appeared, men and children, with as many resin candles as their dwelling could afford. Jean-Baptiste was with them, but another personage of much more extraordinary mien led the way, bearing in his hand a candle about the thickness of his little finger, but which he brandished above his head in a manner of a torch, striding on at the same time with enormous steps and somewhat grotesque gestures. "'Where is the body?' exclaimed he, with a loud tone and vast emphasis. "'Where is the body of the sacred dead?' The man who asked this question was a man of about five feet three in height, fluttering in a pourpoint whose ribbons and rags vied in number, while the brass buttons with which he was thickly strewed might, by their irregularity of position, have induced me to believe him to be a poet, had not his theatrical tone and air stamped him as a disciple of Thespis. Percé jusqu'au fond du cœur, d'une atteinte imprévue aussi bien que mortel, cried he, when he beheld the dead body, Oh, what would I have given to have been here when he was killed? Did he fall so at once? I beseech you, tell me, did he fall thus? And down he cast himself upon his back, in the attitude of the dead body. If anything could have rendered so dreadful a sight as the corpse of the murderer, with his blackened temples, clenched hands, and cold, meaningless glare of eye, in any degree ridiculous, it would have been to see the little player cast upon the ground, beside the vast bulk of the dead man, striving to imitate the position in which he lay, and every now and then raising his pert head from his mockery of death's stillness, and peeping over the corpse to see how the arm or the hand had fallen in dying. I was in no mood, however, for such fooleries. My head ached violently from the blow I had received above the eye. My hands, especially the one that had intercepted the stab of the knife, gave me intolerable pain. I was fatigued also, and fevered with the struggle and the agitation, so that my corporeal sensations were not at all favourable to the wretched player's buffoonery, even had the scene been one that admitted of merriment. Stirring him then rather rudely with my foot, I bade him rise and assist in carrying the body to the cottage. Up started the actor in a moment, and, taking the corpse by the feet, replied he was ready to do anything the manager bade him. One of the cottagers lent his aid, and we soon reached the cottage with our burden. Here all the women made a vast outcry at the sight of the dead body, but more still on beholding the state in which the assassin's efforts had left their young Count Louis, for I was now within the old domain of our old chateau. I know not whether from the loss of blood or the irritating pain of the wounds, but I certainly felt very faint, and probably my countenance showed how much I was suffering, for while the young Arnaud and some others were examining the person of the dead man, and taking what papers and effects he had upon him, the player stepped forward and offered to render me his assistance as a surgeon. Thinking that the devil of buffoonery still possessed him, I repulsed him somewhat rudely, but yet, unrepelled, he laid his hand upon his heart, made me a low bow, and said, "'Listen, noble youth, scion of an illustrious house, and you shall hear that which shall make you yield yourself to my hands, as willingly as Maladine gave herself up to Milsenio. Know then, before my superior genius prompted me to fit on the buskin, I trod the stage of life in a high-heeled shoe, not, indeed, the Cothurnus, far, far from it, for in those days, alas, though I was clothed in tragic black and held the dagger and the bowl, I shed real blood behind the curtain, and inflicted my cruelties on the real flesh and blood. "'I begin somewhat to understand you,' I replied. "'But if you would have me attend to you seriously, my friend, you must drop that exalted style and speak common sense in common language.' "'Well then, sir, I will,' he answered, instantly changing his tone, and taking one which strangely blended in itself in significance and sharpness, but which harmonised much better with his little eager countenance and twinkling black eyes than his tumid, bombastic loudness had done. What I mean is that before I went on the stage, I studied under an apothecary, 
my disposition is not naturally cruel and i was not hard-hearted enough to succeed in that profession now though with the devil's assistance and my master's skill i aided in conveying many a worthy patient from their bed to their coffin yet i think i remember some few simples that would allay the irritation of your wounds and i will undertake for their innocuousness no surer aid was at hand and therefore i willingly allowed the metamorphosed apothecary to bandage up my forehead with such applications as he thought fit as well as to use his skill upon my hands and certainly the ease which i derived from his assistance fully repaid the confidence i had placed in him in the meanwhile the body of the murderer had been searched and the various objects found upon him being brought to me proved to consist of nothing more besides the packet of papers which i had already taken than a few pieces of gold one or two licentious letters and songs a pack of cards some loaded dice a missile two short daggers and a rosary all articles very serviceable in one or other of his callings one of the cottage boys had by this time caught the horse which this very respectable person had ridden and strapped upon it behind was found what at first appeared a cloak but which proved upon examination to be a capuchin's gown confirming my opinion in regard to the owner's identity with the card player at loose when this examination was over i prepared to mount my horse and proceed home but before i went i turned to gaze once more upon the lifeless form of my dead adversary and in looking upon his clumsy limbs and obesity of body i could not understand how he could have so easily overcome me endowed as i felt myself to be with equal strength and far superior agility the sudden surprise could alone have been the cause and i resolved through my future life to struggle for that presence of mind which in circumstances of danger and difficulty is a buckler worth all the armour of achilles after this i bestowed a gold piece upon the player apothecary for the ease he had given me and bade him come over to the chateau de l'orme the next day for a farther reward and then escaping as fast as i could from his hyperbolic thanks i mounted and accompanied by jean baptiste rode on towards my home my first question as we went was how long the chevalier had returned from spain and what had brought him on the road towards lourdes at that time of night at first jean baptiste seemed somewhat reserved but upon being pressed closely on the subject his frank nature would not let him maintain his silence and he informed me that the chevalier had returned that very morning from spain but on hearing that the marquis de saint brie had been received as a visitor at the chateau and that i in return had gone to pass some time with him he had desired the young procureur to accompany him and set out for bagnere without delay saying that i must be saved at all risks but still continued jean baptiste you have done something in spain to lose the chevalier's love for though he would come away after you to-night in spite of all my father could do to prevent him he always took care to say for his father's sake for his mother's sake he would rescue count louis from the dangers into which he was plunged the gloomiest knell that rings over the fall from virtue must be to hear of the lost esteem of those we love that must be the dark the damning scourge which drives on human weakness to despair in crime could the great fallen angel ever have returned i do not believe it the glorious confidence of heaven was lost and mercy would have nothing without oblivion i felt that my friend did me wrong but even that did not save me from the whole bitterness of having lost his regard and i internally asked myself what would my feelings have been had i really merited his bad opinion where is the chevalier demanded i is he at his own house no answered the young man he is at my father's at lourdes my determination was taken immediately to ride over to lourdes the next day and explain to the chevalier my conduct as far as i could with honour to represent to him that i was under a most positive promise not to disclose to any spaniard the events of that night wherein his suspicions had been excited and to add my most solemn asseverations to convince him of my innocence my pride i will own struggled against this resolution but still i saw in the chevalier's conduct towards me 
a degree of lingering affection which I could not bear to lose. The good spirit triumphed, and I determined to sacrifice my pride for the sake of his esteem. These thoughts kept me silent till our arrival at the Chateau de Lorme, where my appearance in such a state, I need not say, created the most terrible consternation. But I will pass by all that, suffice it, that I had to tell my story over at least one hundred times, before I was suffered to retire to bed. Helen, happily, was not present when I arrived, but my mother's embroidery woman did not fail to wake her, as I afterwards heard, for the purpose of communicating the agreeable intelligence, and doubtless made it a thousand times worse than it really was. My poor Helen's night, I am afraid, was but sadly spent. However, when I had satisfied both my father and mother that I was not dangerously injured, and related my story to every old servant in the family who thought they had a right to be as accurately informed in regard to all that occurred to Count Louis as his confessor, I retired to my chamber, and while the maitre d'hôtel fulfilled the functions of Ousay in assisting to undress me, I opened the packet I had found upon the monk, and examined the papers which it contained, but, to my surprise, I found nothing at all relating directly to the Marquis de Saint-Brie. The first thing that presented itself was a regular certificate of the marriage of Gaston François de Bagnol, Count de Bagnol, with Henriette de Verne, dated some seventeen years before, with the names of several witnesses attached. Then followed a paper of much fresher appearance, containing the names of these witnesses, with the word DEAD marked after one, and the address of their present residence affixed to each of the others. Then came a long epistolary correspondence between the above Count de Bagnol and various persons in the town of Rochelle, at the time of its siege, by reading which I clearly found that though influenced by every motive of friendship or relationship to give his aid to the rebellious Rochellois, had constantly refused to do so, and that in consequence, the accusation which the chevalier informed me had been brought against that young nobleman must have been false. On remembering also the cause of enmity which the Marquis de Saint-Brie had against him, and associating that fact with the circumstance of my having found these papers on the body of an assassin hired by the same man, I doubted not for a moment that the charge had been forged by the Marquis himself, and these letters withheld on purpose to prevent the Count from establishing his innocence. Why the Marquis had let them pass from his own hands I could not divine. Without, indeed, he considered them as valueless. Now he had taken care that the justice or injustice of this world could no way affect his victim. I knew that he was far too much a lover of this life alone to value, in his own case or that of others, the cold meed of posthumous renown. Long before I had finished these reflections and the reading of the letters, the maitre d'hôtel, who, as I have said, supplied Ousset's place, had done his part in undressing me, and soon, after ordering my horse to be ready early, I dismissed him and slept. Before closing this chapter, however, I must remark that, for many reasons, I had restricted to the safe guardianship of my own breast the various reasons that led me to suppose the Marquis de Saint-Brie had instigated the attack under which I had so nearly fallen. The suspicions of both my parents turned naturally in that direction, but I well knew that if my father had possessed half the knowledge which I did upon the subject, he would have allowed no consideration to prevent his pursuing the Marquis with the most determined vengeance, to the destruction, perhaps, of all parties. I therefore merely described the attack, but withheld the circumstances which preceded it, and though there are few actions in a man's life which do not either afford him regret or disappointment, this piece of prudence is amongst the scanty number I have never had cause to wish undone. End of chapter 15